Where do I start with this stupendous machine? The machine that introduced so many British children to the wonderful world of computing, me included. To the incredibly creative world of programming, and to the never ending days spent waiting for a game to load. Whilst listening to the delightful sounds of data loading at 1300 board. Well, I guess I start with the first of those points, and that is the introduction. The Speccy, as it's fondly known by its users and fans, was launched by Sinclair Research Limited, one of a number of companies that Sir Clive Sinclair held and renamed throughout this era, in April 1982. Initially by mail order, as with the ZX80 and ZX81 models, it came prior to the new colour machine. In development, the Spectrum was referred to as the ZX82, or Colour ZX81. Although due to it being a massive redesign and improvement over the ZX models, it was decided to give it a new and more appropriate name. The Spectrum soon became the first mainstream computing device in the UK. Sure, the ZX80 and 81 had made the initial impact, but with its full colour graphics, well, eight colours to be exact, nicer keyboard, to an extent, and better programming language and sounds to boot, it was almost comparable to the Commodore 64 which wasn't due on the scene for at least another year, albeit for a much lower price. Initially priced at £125 for the less popular 16 kilobyte model, and £175 for the staggeringly mind-blowing 48K model, these prices, as with Sinclair's other computing products, undercut pretty much everything else in the market. The Commodore 64 was released at £399 in 1983. And not only was this more than double the Spectrum's price, but the Sinclair machine had been given ample time to create a huge foothold in the personal computing market. This was even more the case when the prices were dropped to £99 and £129 respectively the following year, leading Commodore to make some significant price cuts pretty quickly in order to compete. Approximately 60,000 issue 1 Spectrums were produced, although functional units are quite rare these days. More common are the Issue 2 onwards, which had bluish grey keys, as opposed to the light grey in Issue 1 iterations. The motherboard design was also refined, and this is something that continued through the years with the later iterations. It didn't take long after its launch for the machine to be talk of the playground, or the office. With young kids and adults alike spending days tapping out magazine code in order to get a functional game on the screen. And if you haven't done it yourself, Trust me, using the Spectrum as a rubberized keyboard, its quirky shortcut commands, and dealing with the magazine misprints was a full time occupation in itself, although highly rewarding nonetheless. Sinclair's advertising was typically very text heavy and a detailed affair, keen to show off the capabilities of each machine versus the cost, and although Sinclair had dominated the UK market from the ZX80 up until the Spectrum, the new colour personal computing landscape presented many competitors and associated battles along the way. Although pricing of the Spectrum was a winning point, its early release was key to its dominance. But before it was even released, battles were being fought in the world of home microcomputers. One of the more famous of these stories is the rivalry between Sinclair and Acorn Computers, a tale which is beautifully told in the BBC dramatisation Micromen. It follows the story of Chris Curry, a founding member of Acorn Computers and an ex-Sinclair employee, who left Sinclair to launch the Acorn Atom at a time when Sinclair was pushing his ZX80 and 81 models. The Atom was reasonably successful, but it was Acorn winning the contract to produce the BBC branded microcomputer which really set the scene for Sinclair to push the Spectrum forward where it quickly dominated in a particular area of the market which Acorn so desperately wanted, but could never quite reach. That was the lucrative and emerging world of computer games. The BBC home computer was seen as a much more serious educational computer, a market which ironically Clive wanted. This crossover of interests was one of the key reasons why Acorn and Sinclair ultimately failed in the mid 80s launching machines aimed at each other's marketplace whilst taking their eyes off the ball to the new and emerging competitors such as Amstrad, Atari and Commodore's emerging brand Amiga. 1985 saw the Sinclair Spectrum 
name sold to Alan Sugar, who at the time was succeeding with his Amstrad CPC models. Mainly by targeting consumers who wanted an incredibly easy to use computer setup, achieved by selling all the CPC range with a bundled monitor, whilst keeping costs low using outsourced manufacture. Are you very bitter about that? Yes. Although the Speccy was launched in 1982 and the name sold in 1985, the machine still managed to stay in production for 10 years, albeit under several makeovers and revisions. Be sure to join me for part 2 of this review where I'll be looking at each hardware iteration individually. Thank you for watching part 1 of my review and story of my favourite childhood machine, the Spectrum. Stay tuned for parts 2 and 3 which will be coming up over the next few weeks along with various other videos when and if I get time for them. Thanks again, goodbye.